Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our discussion of Chapter 6, this particularly depreciation. So this is Part 2. Um, we are uh, applying the depreciation methods. Now, in reality, you don't have to really necessarily uh, understand the calculations behind this the 200% declining balance or the 150% declining balance switching a straight line. Those first two. Because we're going to just be able to make our calculations using the table. So going to our, I'm going to show you the table. This is a table. Notice this has the half year convention. So as long as your assets were bought in a you know, normal way and you're not worried about what day they were bought in a particular year, you're doing this for 2020, it was bought in April, let's say, okay? That means if you've determined it is five year property, you take the cost or the basis of that property and year one of depreciation, 2020, you take the cost, say it was $10,000, and you multiply it by 20% or 0.2, and that's how much depreciation under the maker's normal depreciation you would um, take as depreciation as a deduction in year one. In year two, 2021, you would multiply that same $10,000 by the 32% or 0.32 in year three by 0.192, by 0 0.1152, 0.1152 and 0.576. Half a year in the first year, half a year in the, in the sixth year. So that's four whole years and two halves equal five years, right? That's how the half year convention works. Uh, and that is basically how you calculate depreciation under the maker's uh, situation. It, you do the same thing with the other columns if that's where the asset belonged. All right. Now, if the IRS was concerned that we would buy all our assets at the end of the year and take a whole, a half, whole half a year depreciation. So if you buy more than 40% of your depreciable assets other than real estate in the fourth quarter of the year, then you have to use the mid quarter convention for all the assets you bought that year. Once you use that mid quarter convention for the year it was purchased, you have to use it for any subsequent years as well. It's you're stuck with it. So when you're using the mid quarter convention, you have to decide what quarter it was purchased in. So in 2020, if you bought it any time in January through March, you would use this table. Okay. And then if it was any time between April and June, you would use this table. So unlike the first table, which you use, no matter when during the year you bought it, if you are subject, because you bought too much of your assets at the end of the year, if you're subject to the mid-quarter convention, you have to then split up your assets into what, which ones were purchased during each quarter and then use the table that applies. You do it the same way. You take the cost, the original cost or the basis, you multiply it by 0.25 if we were using this second quarter, then 0.3, then 0 0.18, 0 0.1137, 0 0.1137, 0 0.426. You see there's some differences there, but not a huge amount from what we experienced in the half year convention. Okay, so that's what you would use all the way through. Now, you can use tables for... Uh, the 27 and a half, the real estate or 39 years, but it's really easier just to take the cost or the basis, divide by either 27 and a half or 39, 
divide by 12, and then multiply by whatever the number of months in the first year that you had it. Remember that always treating it as it happened the half of the month. So if it was bought any time in May, you would treat it as if it happened on May 15th, and any assets would then be multiplied by, you would take the cost, divide by, let's say 39 because it's a commercial property, divide by 12, and then multiply by 7.5, right? Because it's from May 15th uh, through the end of the year. Now the next year for that same building, you don't need to worry about the months. All you need to do is take the cost divided by 39 and you're good to go because it, you owned it for the whole year in the second year and the third year and the fourth year because it's straight line so it's easy that way. All right, let's go back to our slideshow. And get pick up on the things that sometimes for a great deal of the time we don't need to worry about calculating depreciation because remember I told you that Congress has put a whole bunch of what we call, call special depreciation rules try to encourage uh, companies to buy lots of assets grow their business okay so the first one is what's called section 179 expense and what that means is for 2020 you can buy up to one million and forty thousand dollars of assets that qualify um they can't be for rental purposes there's some limitations but for the most part if it's not a real estate so it's not a uh, rental property it's not a commercial property it is anything else machinery that sort of thing then you can use section 179 and you can take the whole cost of the asset okay depreciate it all in the year you buy it you don't have to worry about all that calculation you don't have to worry about the tables or anything like that you simply have to just uh, you have it qualify uh, and that however has this important limitation you cannot create a net operating loss meaning it's limited to how much income you have from that business so if your business only makes three thousand dollars of profit you cannot take a huge amount of section 179 expense you have to uh, limit that to the amount of the income from the business as well so that's one way that they have said okay you don't have to worry about it. if you had assets that cost four million dollars you could take the first million and forty and the rest of it would then be calculated using the tables like we discussed okay so if anything left after you use this bonus or this depreciation this section 179 is done the usual what we refer to as maker's way okay now they had to up the ante even more the section 179 has been around a while but they had to make it even more advantageous more enticing to buy assets and so they created what's called bonus depreciation it is up to a hundred percent of the cost of an asset as long as the useful life is under 20 years so again not real estate not buildings um, basically everything else um, so that means you buy an asset in 2020 a computer you can deduct under this bonus depreciation the whole cost of it if you choose you don't have to do it it's an election okay um, and take that as an expense this does not have an issue does not have a limit based on income but it does have a limit using the luxury auto limits we'll talk about in a minute it does mean that that section 179 is less important because typically the bonus depreciation is more 
inclusive, meaning it has a wider uh, definition of what qualifies, what fits the definitions of what can work. All right, so typically you want to look at either one of these special depreciation rules before you calculate using the tables. Now, here's where both of these special deals uh, and all depreciation is limited, and that's what we call listed property. So on the Form 4562, for, where you show the depreciation, on the back side or page two, there is a list of certain kinds of assets that you have to show your depreciation in very in a lot more detail. That's what we mean by listed property. And the IRS has said, we're more suspicious about these assets than other assets. We're not really worried about you using that um, stamping machine uh, at home for personal use. But we are concerned about autos, boats, um, other things like that, that could have a mixed personal business use. We want you to tell us more detail about the use of those assets so we can make sure you're not just um, pretending that there is business use. Okay, so, and if it's a listed property, autos or boats, then um, you've got some things, you can't use section 179 if it's used for less than 50% for business. It has to be straight line depreciation. You can't use the tables if it's listed for less than 50% of the business. So you've got those limitations, okay? Then we got worried about people buying really expensive cars and taking large depreciation deductions against their business. So they buy really, really fancy cars and take large depreciation. Um, so we have a limit referred to as the luxury automobile limits, okay? It applies to autos less than 6,000 pounds. If you uh, can, will take the, the um, bonus depreciation, then you could have as much as 18,100 on an auto in the first year. So instead of using the tables to calculate it, you, well, you still have to use a table to calculate the depreciation on your auto and then compare it to this. It can't be more than, these are the maximums, not the minimum, the maximum depreciation. And this is for, for a car you, you put into, into place in 2020. These apply as long as you own that automobile, even if they change in year 2021, because you bought it in 2020, these limits still apply. And in 2019, you have to look those limits up if you're dealing with an auto that was bought in 2019 because these limits were a little different in that year. And they'll apply to anything bought in, 20, in 2019. If you choose not to use the bonus, then the limit is 10,100. Now, if you were to buy a car that costs a hundred thousand dollars your calculation of depreciation in year one using the tables would be more than eighteen thousand one hundred you would only do eighteen thousand one hundred the next year you would only do to sixteen one hundred no matter what you calculated with the tables the next year ninety seven hundred next year fifty seven sixty and then you would take the same fifty seven sixty every year after that until you depreciated the full 100,000. So instead of just over five years, like a typical automobile that's under the amount, it would be limited and then you still get a full 100,000, but it may take 10 or 15 years, okay? These apply under 6,000 pounds, that's the gross vehicle weight. You'll look that up for any vehicle. If it's greater than that, we can apply the bonus. There's an underlying section 179 limit. Instead of the million dollars, it's only 25,900 on SUVs, but the bonus depreciation rules pretty much makes that not apply. So um, now you can pretty much buy whatever, as long as the vehicle's 
bigger than a car type of thing, you can take a, the bonus depreciation on it. Now, you can't get around this by leasing a vehicle, not fully. If you lease a vehicle, um, then, and it's a luxury vehicle, what you do is you, there's a table and they were published every year. You look at the value of the vehicle when you bought it. You look at a, there's a little, there's an amount that has to be uh, reduced from the deduction for the lease payment. So you look at your lease payment, you subtract out this amount from the table uh, based on the number of payments, whatever number of payment it is, and uh, the value of the vehicle. So it ends up with your income going up because you reduce the deduction. Okay, so uh, not, not a huge deal. It's usually not a very big uh, adjustment, but it's something that uh, you want to remember. So, other than depreciation uh, that we spent the last 10 slides on, uh, transportation and travel. And you probably want to try to get clients and things to, to differentiate between those two. Transportation is expensive getting from one place to another, you know, local. And travel is when you're overnight out of town. Okay, so that's how the rules read, and that's when what you need to look up versus based depending on what you're looking for uh, is the rules versus transportation versus travel. Okay, so local transportation costs getting from one workplace to another. So you have a business. Okay, um, you let's say you run a bookstore. Okay, you drive from your house to your bookstore that you own. That is not deductible, that's commuting expense. But once you're at the bookstore, you drive from that bookstore over to a auction house where you pick up some books you bought and drive back. That would be uh, deductible mileage. That would be transportation costs. Okay, if you go from your bookstore and deliver books to a customer, let's say. You personalize that d delivery. That would be, and come back, that would be uh, de deductible transportation, okay? You meet with a customer at the, uh, the binder that's going to repair some books for you, or you deliver that, that would be uh, a deductible transportation cost. Now, if, you have a temporary assignment. Uh, wouldn't work very well with the bookstore example, but if you were a um, some type of providing service, or say you're a plumber or something like that, and you are hired to plumb a house, and so therefore for the next two months you're driving to that. Uh, that's not your normal. That's a temporary workplace then the cost of driving to there is deductible, assuming it's further than driving to your normal place of business, okay? Uh, at least the difference. So you would subtract out what your normal commute time would be or commute miles would be to figure that out, okay? Now, if you can establish your home office as a work location, because you use it substantially and regularly for your business, then driving from your house to a business locations becomes deductible. It's no longer commuting because your house becomes a business location and driving from your house to other business locations is from one workplace to another workplace on this list. So you track your miles. The easiest way to deal with it is just to keep a log and then multiply the number of miles times 57.5% per mile. That covers gasoline. It covers uh, depreciation on your vehicle. You don't have to keep track of repairs or maintenance or all that stuff, uh, car washes. But you can deduct on top of that any tolls or parking costs that you legitimately pay, not the fines you pay when you get caught for uh, illegally parking. You can also decide to keep track of all your actual expenses, keep all your receipts and all that type of thing. 
um, but that's much more difficult. It would usually work out if, see, to get 57 and a half cents a mile, the IRS averages together all the costs of various vehicles. If yours is a really high cost vehicle with low gas mileage, high depreciation, high maintenance costs, an older vehicle, then you're probably going to spend more than 57 and a half cents. By the time you add up all your costs, figure out what part of it was for business versus other things, you probably will have a higher deduction that way. Okay. Now you can't just flip flop every year. You have to kind of stick with it. So most of the time it's just easier and better, especially if you're driving around a low cost vehicle to use the mileage. Okay. Now, when you go out of town overnight, usually uh, 100 miles away or so, okay, at least, then you've got the, the cost to get there. You've got the, the lodging while you're there. You've got meals. You've got the possibility you might have to, you know, dry clean your clothes or do something like that. Get them clean one way or another because you got a meeting. Um, and it's not going to last one year. Once you, if, if you are assigned to this new location and they tell you you're going to be there for the next two years, now you, your home has changed. And so now going there is not away from home anymore. Your home has become this new location. But as long as that's not the case, then going to that place can continue to be a temporary workplace. All right. So you may have, maybe it's a, for a trip out of town for a conference that can be deductible and can be, um, split between your, even if you did some personal, as long as your primary purpose for going is the conference and you go to Disneyland, um, for a day after the conference is over, you just have to allocate the hotel, um, any cost while you're there, like meals and stuff between the business part and the personal part. If you fly there and the primary purpose is flying is to go for the conference, you do not have to allocate the, the, the airline fare. You can just have that because you would have had to pay the airline to just go to the conference. You didn't have to pay any more for the airline because you went to Disneyland on the last day of the conference or the after the conference was over. All right. So you can split it now. Of course, there's always a thing. If it's too extravagant, we might be a problem. And the IRS provides a kind of a guideline and it's what's called per diem. And you can actually use that for this kind of travel and just, and not, all you have to do is prove that you went and the purpose of your visit and you don't have to keep all the receipts. You can use the IRS's basic guidelines as this is how much you would need to spend if you were staying in Houston for three or four days. This is the, this is the cost per day for a hotel. This is a cost per day for meals. This is a cost per day for incidentals. Uh, and you can utilize that and make your deduction that way and save yourself a lot of headaches. Now meals while you're on the go, okay, are deductible 50% unless you are doing some contract work and your client reimburses you for your meals. So you send them, you say, okay, I'll do this project for you, but you have to pay for maybe $2,000 plus my meal costs while I'm there for a week or whatever. Then, and you have to provide them with the, the receipts and they give you exactly what that is. You don't have to reduce that by 50%. You can deduct the full cost of the meals against the income that you're going to report when they reimburse you. Okay. To be a business meal, it has to be directly related or associated with business. No, no more entertainment. No club fees, none of those things are deductible, but a meal where there's business discussed, a meal right after a business deal is made or before, okay? 
and you can use, like we discussed, a per diem. Okay, the meal should not be lavish or extravagant, although uh, that one's a pretty tough one for the IRS to challenge when it comes to meal expenses.